All right, I think we have reached uh, the magic moment to get started this morning. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to Surgery Grand Rounds. Thank you for joining us uh, for another uh, virtual session uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I actually, though I, I do think that we all miss seeing and inter interacting with each other uh, in person, uh, uh, you know, this has provided some advantages, so I hope that we, you all will continue to take advantage of this. Um, we are recording Grand Round sessions at this time, uh, given the modality that we have available, so we will be making those available should anyone want to see them at a later date as well. So this morning, our speaker is Dr. Nicole Zern. Dr. Zern is well known to our faculty. Uh, after completing her medical education at Emory University, she came to the University of Washington for her general surgery residency. She then completed fellowship in endocrine surgery at Royal North Shore Hospital in, excuse me, Sydney, Australia. She returned to the University of Washington in 2016 to join the faculty in both general and endocrine surgery at the University Medical Center. Since returning, she has played a key role in elevating and advancing endocrine surgery by helping to develop a thyroid cancer pathway for the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, uh, has chaired the Endocrine Surgery Council and is co-chair of the Pheochromocytoma Task Force. She's also been very active in the Department of Surgery Women's Council, has been the president of the Harkin Surgical Society, and has taken on several leadership roles in surgical education by being a member of the University of Washington Graduate Medical Education Committee and also being one of our associate program directors for the General Surgery Residency. Dr. Zern, it's a pleasure to have you with us this morning, and I greatly look forward to hearing all the updates you have for us today. Hi, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here uh, with you all today. Thank you so much, Dr. Marquardt, for this opportunity to present. Um, I know we were shifting gears a bit from our, our recent topics um, into one of more uh, clinical uh, setting, and so I'm happy to present this information. I know this is a very nuanced aspect of endocrine surgery, but hopefully we'll give you a good a picture of things that you should know and, and take us all the way back to medical school, which for many of us wasn't too long ago, including our new med students that have just started this week. Uh, a lot of this may seem a bit more familiar to them, but for us, it's, it's in there somewhere. And so we're going to bring it back out and, and put it a little more relevant for today. All right, so first we'll start, as I mentioned, with a bit of review of what we learned in med school, specifically highlighting what is the rule of tens. Um, and how does that apply to the management of pheochromocytoma? I know a lot of us relied on mnemonics. Uh, when we were in medical school, I know I sure did. And so, um, uh, did the screen just do something weird, Deb? For some reason, it went away from your screen share. So it maybe did. try. I think someone else started sharing their screen. <laughs> Once, in one second. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. Is that okay? Yep, fantastic, thank you. Yep, no problem. Um, and so after we review a bit of the basics of pheochromocytoma, we're gonna focus um, on the UW experience in multidisciplinary management, uh, highlighting our pheochromocytoma task force, focus a bit on surgical techniques, what's new um, and what's tried and true, and then revise this rule of 10 specifically uh, with its relevance to genetic testing and evaluation, as well as the new uh, management of malignant disease. All right, so pheochromocytoma is a long word and it's often abbreviated as pheo, uh, which you'll hear me use interchangeably throughout the, the talk today. And this is overall a very rare tumor. It is a neuroendocrine tumor of neuroectodermal origin that occurs along the spine. And the majority of these occur in the adrenal gland. And when this is the case, this is known as a pheochromocytoma, specifically referring to an adrenaline producing tumor that occurs in the adrenal gland. When it occurs outside of the adrenal gland along the paravertebral sympathetic chain, it's known as a paraganglioma. And so while both words are long and start with P, um, it's similar cell type, it just refers to the location of the tumor. And the majority of the talk today is gonna focus on the management of pheochromocytoma, but the management of paraganglioma is very similar both for uh, genetic workup and metastatic disease. So in medical school, we learn a lot about the classic symptoms that someone with a pheo is gonna present. They're gonna have a history of episodic hypertension that's very high spikes, you know, 220, 240 systolics. Uh, 
We're gonna hear about palpitations and cardiac symptoms, possibly cardiac arrhythmias, diaphoresis, headaches. Um, but the classic triad of symptoms is actually only present in about a quarter of patients that have these tumors. Um, and actually about a quarter of them are asymptomatic and may not even have a diagnosis of hypertension at all, especially if they're much younger. Um, and so often these tumors can even be diagnosed as an incidental finding on CT imaging done for another etiology. Um, and so despite what we usually associate with it, that's not always the case in clinical presentation. So what is this rule of tens? Well, it's a mnemonic that's used a lot of times in medical school um, appropriately, historically, uh, describing 10% chance of things associated with FIOs. Specifically, 10% of these tumors are malignant. 10% can be bilateral, so occurring in both adrenal glands. 10% are inherited genetically. 10% occur outside of the adrenal, those paragangliomas. And 10% occur in children. And so throughout the talk today, you'll hear us kind of or you'll hear me kind of address different points of this and debunk a few of these and update them with some modern um, percentages. So the rule doesn't necessarily apply as well as it used to. To diagnose a pheochromocytoma, it is a biochemical diagnosis. That means labs, either serum or urine analysis in order to document catecholamine excess. This is done either with a 24 hour urine catecholamine collection or more recently, we've been more frequently using just a plasma metanephrine level. And this is obviously logistically a lot simpler for patients. It's just a blood draw. Um, it can be done anytime throughout the day. It does not have to be fasting. Um, but usually the phlebotomist will have the patient sit um, or either lie down supine as best prep or either lie down um, in order uh, to eliminate uh, any natural catecholamine surge. Uh, at the time of the draw. Um, but certainly for patients, this is a lot better logistically than a 24-hour urine collection and has just as good sensitivity and specificity. Similarly, imaging studies are helpful to make the diagnosis because a pheochromocytoma is based on its location within the adrenal gland. So the complement between the CT imaging and the biochemistry gives you your diagnosis. The take-home point on this is do not biopsy these tumors. Um, this still happens pretty frequently, um, especially when imaging for the workup of another malignancy demonstrates an adrenal mass. And naturally, with a workup for malignancy, we want a tissue diagnosis. Uh, and so the first inclination is to biopsy. However, I would argue that every adrenal mass and retroperitoneal mass should have, at a minimum, catecholamines assessed prior to any biopsy to ensure that it is not a pheochromocytoma prior to biopsy. Otherwise, these patients will have a, an adrenaline surge at the time of the biopsy, can often result in atrial fibrillation or other cardiac events and is not a best practice, certainly. All right, so the treatment of pheochromocytoma, this is more or less the more simple slide of this entire talk, but the definitive treatment is surgical resection. Um, but, it's not just that simple. As with any operation, we have to consider our approach, but these patients, given the hormonal activity associated with their tumors, need very coordinated preoperative care, postoperative care, uh, and then further down the line, we have to think about surveillance and monitoring. And so in order to streamline and standardize our best practices here at the University of Washington, we created the Pheochromocytoma Task Force, which was chaired by myself and Dr. Ron Paul Dean about a year and a half ago. Um, and he's a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and the director of the Critical Care Fellowship uh, here at UW and had a lot of experience with these tumors as well. Uh, the other members of our task force are seen here. And we created a multidisciplinary group, including members um, from our endocrinology department, which are absolutely vital as you'll hear about in a second. Um, as well as several other members specifically um, from our anesthesia department, including Dr. Katie Heller, who's the director of the surgical ICU here at the University of Washington Montlake campus. Dr. Wendy Sewer is the director of the pre-anesthesia clinic here. And Dr. John Lang, many of you are familiar with, um, and Dr. David Bird, my senior partner as well. Um, another pivotal member of our team was Celeste Rind, who is the representative from the UW Transformations of Care team. 
and helped us formalize this into an official clinical pathway for patients, uh, resulting in uh, publication on the Occam website. Uh, and ultimately, we'll have a power plan in Epic when that day arrives. So with our task force, we targeted uh, the coordination and standardization of care for the patients with pheochromocytoma into three groups, preoperative care, intraoperative care, and postoperative care, as you can see delineated here by the certain team members. And so not every team member was required to be present for all meetings, but just the ones where they were applicable and had a, had a key role. And this group, again, with the Transformation of Care team, formulated the official clinical pathway documents, which you can see here. They're pretty busy. Um, but I'm gonna go through just a couple of the highlights. Preoperative care of the patient with pheochromocytoma is much more intricate uh, than for some other operations due to the hormonal productivity of the tumors. You remember that these are, are sporadically secreting adrenaline, and so, it is very key to prepare the body for the stress of surgery and the anticipated additional adrenaline rush that comes with an operation um, well in advance of, of their surgery to make their general anesthesia and their operation as safe as possible. So in order to do that, they usually end up in the surgeon's office first based on a referral because, as I mentioned, the definitive treatment for this condition is surgical resection. And at the surgical visit, it's very important to not only discuss with the patient the routine aspects of surgical care, consent, et cetera, but also plan for and select your operative date. Um, and while this is not always a usual practice, this date is very important because the remainder of their preoperative preparation is based specifically on the date of surgery. The first thing is that the patients will begin alpha blockade approximately 10 to 14 days prior to your selected operative date. And in our system, we like to coordinate this via the endocrinologist. And so the patients will meet with the endocrinologist as well, who will prescribe alpha blockade to begin on that targeted date. In medical school, we all learned about phenoxybenzamine as a great alpha blocker, and indeed it is. Uh, however, in the United States, this drug has become very expensive and is pretty much cost prohibitive for most of our patients despite insurance. And so lately, our practice here has been to use doxazosin instead, as it is more affordable and readily available. Um, and the doxazosin dose starts as a two milligram dose about 10 to 14 days preoperatively, but then is up titrated throughout that time period to a maximum tolerable dose by the date of the operation. This is all done by the endocrinologists and their nursing teams, which are in frequent contact with the patients every two to three days throughout this time period, recording both heart rate and blood pressure. And what they're looking for is orthostatic hypotension. That's kind of our goal. Um, we'd like the patient to demonstrate all the parameters of orthostasis, including a systolic blood pressure near 90, if possible. Um, and as you might expect with this, they often will experience rebound tachycardia. And if that is the case, a beta blocker is then also initiated. Um, many of these patients are often on a beta blocker ahead of time, um, and so usually that's continued, but both um, the alpha and the beta blockade can be ramped up in preparation for surgery to the maximum tolerable dose based on symptoms. The second aspect of preoperative care that is key um, that we really help standardize with this task force um, is the pre-anesthesia visit. And so we found it was best practice in our institution to time this one week prior to the desired operative date. And this is an additional check for the patient to see how they're doing with ramping up their medication, how is their medication compliance going, and how are they feeling? Because the alpha blockade really makes people feel quite fatigued. Being high, orthostatic hypotension all the time doesn't really make you feel good. So um, it's important to have this check-in with the patient to make sure they're still safe and that they're fluid loading and, and keeping enough intravascular volume, um, as well as drawing a type and screen. The next segment of our task force involved the intraoperative care of patients with pheochromocytoma. Um, and as you might ima imagine, the multidisciplinary approach is extremely important for this aspect of their care as well. Um, the during the operation, patients with pheochromocytoma can have spikes of hypertension. Again, systolics can be well above 200, and this is with very minimal manipulation. 
Um, but the one of the most common time periods for this to happen during the operation is actually with direct laryngoscopy during planned intubation. And for this reason, it's very important that patients have an arterial line placed pre-induction so that we can have a continuous blood pressure monitor in place as the laryngoscopy is taking place because then you can really see their blood pressure start to spike and then treat it proactively with vasodilators before it gets to that really high and dangerous level. Um, the next thing that all patients have is after a successful intubation, they will have a central line placed, usually in the right internal jugular vein. Prior to our task force, these practices were pretty variable um, and definitely provider dependent um, based on it, you know, both the anesthesia provider and the surgeon's preference and, and time and comorbidities and those types of aspects. But we found it most useful with our task force to really say, you know, hey guys, we are going to have all these things on every patient. And this has helped streamline our process. All of the techs know to have all the equipment available and all the providers doing these cases know that this is our plan and is definitely safest from a best practice standpoint as there can often be unanticipated swings in hemodynamics. Um, as with any you know, long abdominal operation, Foley catheter is placed for urine output monitoring, but this is also kept in place afterwards. Uh, for hemodynamic monitoring um, and fluid resuscitation goals as well. Um, and then glucose checks are hourly during these operations. Um, an additional component of the hormonal activity of pheochromocytomas is that they can cause and contribute to hyperglycemia and insulin resistance. And so often these patients will have a diagnosis of diabetes or at least some elevated glucose preoperatively that needs insulin during the operation. However, subsequent to tumor resection, just as the blood pressure will decrease from withdrawal of the catecholamines that the tumor was producing, blood sugar will also decrease as a result. And so patients can become hypoglycemic following tumor resection. So hourly glucose checks is very important during these operations. Um, our group also decided that it was best practice to have only the critical care anesthesiologists perform these operations in conjunction with the surgical members um, for the reasons stated above. Um, and you can see here, this is an example of one of our uh, drips that we use during the operation, which is primed already with both vasodilators and vasoconstrictors because the fluctuations from pre-tumor excision need the vasodilators. And then as soon as you excise the tumor um, and the patient vasodilates on their own, then we need some vasoconstriction and fluids to run in um, in order to resuscitate them. So we need to be prepared for both extremes of hemodynamics at all times during the operation. Our post-operative team heavily involved in the surgical ICU. Um, and we, with our task force, have now mandated that all of these patients go to the SICU post-operatively for care. And in large part, this is due to the need for increased monitoring we need hourly glucose checks, as I just mentioned, for the risk of hypoglycemia. But we also need ongoing fluid resuscitation, which very frequently involves vasopressor support. As the patient's tumor secreting the adrenaline is resected, there's an immediate loss of the tone within the vascular system leading to vasodilation. And so another med school adage that we always use is to fill the tank. And as the vessels are vasodilated, we want to get more and more fluid into the system, but we also may need some vasopressor support in the meantime until the other adrenal begins to work and use enough of its normal adrenaline to regulate and also give enough time for the preoperative alpha blockade to work its way out of its system and allow the normal amount um, of adrenaline to work. Um, and so this is best monitored in an ICU setting. And we created standardized goals for floor transfer so patients who do not have as, as an extreme case of hypotension can come to the floor sooner uh, rather than take up valuable ICU space if it's not needed. These are a few of the documents our task force helped create with the transformation of care team that are given to patients. Um, and these are very similar to those used for many other operations, patient-friendly, uh, education modules kind of highlighting all of these different aspects from their perspective. Um, and these are also accessible on the Occam website as well, uh, which is a great resource for medical students, uh, residents, and myself when I need to get these documents. All right, so circling back a bit to the surgical approach to the adrenal gland. 
as we know, this is a retroperitoneal organ. Uh, and so to get to it, there's a variety of approaches. The standard open operation is best for large tumors um, or those where you have a very high suspicion of malignancy. And this can be approached open with either a vertical midline incision or a subcostal incision. Minimally invasive, of, of, minimally invasive approaches are now the standard of care for adrenal surgery um, and happen most frequently. Even for some larger tumors, this can be approached successfully with either robotic or laparoscopic equipment. Um, but the approach varies depending on whether you want to go through the peritoneal cavity anteriorly or directly into the retroperitoneum posteriorly. So we're going to highlight a few aspects of these surgical approaches as well. Starting first with the laparoscopic adrenalectomy, which I would say is probably the most common practice and most familiar for most of us. Um, the patients are positioned laterally here. This is gonna be for a left adrenalectomy. And you can see the placement of the ports just below the costal margin in the left upper quadrant. Thank you to my colleague, David Bird, for a few of the slides here. Um, and as we get to videos in a second, I'd like to thank Dr. Afalayan, one of our chief residents, um, who not only was performing the operation, but helped me with <laughs> recording it and getting access to the videos. So thanks, Toby. Um, the view of the left upper quadrant, schematically, you can see here, as we all know, the splenic flexor of the colon is in close proximity to the spleen. And this is what it looks like laparoscopically. Um, so again, you can see the spleen in the left upper quadrant and the natural connections between the splenic flexure of the colon to the abdominal wall. The adrenal gland is basically behind this stuff. Um, so as it's in the retroperitoneum, you can't see it. Um, even with, as you'll see in a minute, there is a fairly large tumor hiding back there, but you can't really tell at this point um, until you mobilize these structures. So the initial part of the operation involves the splenic flexure mobilization followed by release of the splenodiaphragmatic ligament in order to rotate the spleen and the pancreas medially. Once that's been achieved, we can then view, you can see the spleen up here. This is the retroperitoneum, the anterior surface of Gerota's fascia. And you can see that hovering within this is a large adrenal tumor. I know it's not too obvious because there's perinephric and periadrenal fat, but this particular tumor is fairly large and you can see it here right under the surface. So first, uh, we use the ligature or harmonic uh, sealing device to enter into the retroperitoneum. Next, we then open directly Gerota's fascia. And as we do so, you can definitely see here a lot of fat surrounding the adrenal gland and we're working to develop the plane between the adrenal gland and the kidney which is just inferior to it. So as we dissect here, you can see the inferior aspect of the tumor comes into view, as well as normal adrenal tissue, which is this nice thick yellow stuff here, as opposed to the thin yellow stuff of the surrounding fat. So here's the inferior border of the adrenal, and then we're developing the plane between the adrenal gland and the kidney. Now, the most important part of adrenal surgery, especially with a pheochromocytoma resection, is ligation of the adrenal vein. This is the main vascular outflow from the tumor, which is taking all of the adrenaline it's producing and releasing it into systemic circulation. And so, as you manipulate the tumor throughout the operation, it can shower adrenaline and cause some of the hemodynamic fluctuations we've discussed. However, once you ligate this vein, the majority of that fluctuation will stop, aside from some small venous collaterals, which are usually present. And so you definitely need to coordinate with your anesthesia team uh, at the time to ensure that they know that you're about to ligate the vein so they can be prepared for those hemodynamic fluctuations. Uh, here you can see the pancreas is rotated medially. This is the posterior surface of the pancreas. And this is our adrenal mass here. The vein was just visualized a second ago, and this pause is when we're not only getting our clip applier ready uh, to take the adrenal vein, but we are verbally communicating with our anesthesia team to make sure that they're ready for us to clip, stop the outflow of the adrenaline, and anticipate some hypotension in the next few minutes. And it really does happen that quickly. Um, so here you can see we're getting ready to place our clip uh, to ligate this vein. Um, just an anatomy reminder on the left, the adrenal vein is draining directly down into the renal vein 
whereas on the right adrenal, the vein is draining directly into the vena cava. So there's our successful placement of the clip, stopping our adrenaline outflow from this tumor. All right, and this is a photo post-dissection. Again, you can see the spleen is up here, the posterior surface of the pancreas. Here is the cephalad aspect of the kidney, and then this is where the adrenal was, uh, the very clean adrenal bed with the psoas muscle posteriorly and the clipped adrenal vein here medially. Um, we just allow the spleen and pancreas to rotate back in place, and then the operation is concluded. So the posterior approach, again, this can be approached either robotically or using standard laparoscopy equipment. Um, but this approach is very different because you're going to go directly into the retroperitoneum. Um, and as a result, the patient needs to be positioned prone. And so in order to perform this operation, you must carefully select your patient population. First thing is, if someone's going to be prone, they need to have a favorable body habitus to do so. Um, and so if somebody has a, a lot of abdominal obesity, it's very difficult to prone them successfully um, and have the intra-abdominal structures not push back, shrinking your retroperitoneal space. Um, secondly, significant either cardiac or pulmonary abnormalities may preclude the ability to ventilate in the prone position. Um, and so they also may not be best for this approach. And then other anatomic considerations include the actual tumor itself that you're planning to resect. Uh, large tumors are very difficult to remove with this approach because the retroperitoneum is a much, much smaller space than the peritoneal cavity. Um, and as such, the working room is very limited. Uh, the ports are very close together and there's not a lot of room for manipulation. And so if tumors, my personal cutoff is five centimeters is the largest tumor that I will remove with this approach. Um, I know some surgeons can, will do up to six centimeters, but in general, the, the large massive pheochromocytomas cannot be resected this way. There's just not enough room to move the tumor within the small retroperitoneal space. And the other consideration that I put into practice, into my practice is where the tumor is located in respect to the kidney. Now, we all know the adrenal gland sits right above the kidney, usually. Um, but as tumors grow, they can certainly grow anteriorly and weight the tumor down. Um, and so as you're approaching it from the back and posteriorly, if you see the back of the kidney and the adrenal gland is actually in front of it, you don't have a good way to move the kidney to get to the tumor. So I always review the scan carefully to make sure that I, own, that I op offer this operation appropriately to patients with not only a favorable body habitus, uh, but appropriate tumor anatomy as well. All right, so here's a scan showing a left adrenal mass. This is very similar to the operation that we just watched. However, you need to flip it in your mind because we're gonna do a posterior approach. And so we are gonna be going in through the paraspinous musculature posteriorly just below the ribs, rather than entering into the peritoneal cavity, which is at least with general surgery, our standard uh, train of thought. All right, so this video is not ours, but is very good from Sages and is going to show the port placement and then we'll kind of go through a few of the steps of the posterior approach and make ourselves familiar with the anatomy. So here you can see the port placement is very different than anteriorly because it's blunt. Um, after the skin incision, this surgeon is going into the retroperitoneum bluntly through the muscles, just burrowing in. And then the other two working ports are placed under direct palpation, again, bluntly. There's no visualization at this point. Uh, the cavity is very small, um, and there's not room to look from your camera port over uh, at the other port placement. So here you can see two working five millimeter ports uh, and a larger camera port in the middle, 12 millimeters. Inside, the initial view has a lot of areolar tissue um, very reminiscent of a preperitoneal hernia repair where you need to develop the space first with the camera um, and then secondly with your instruments. So after you've developed that space here, you can see this surgeon is incising Gerota's fascia from behind to enter into the posterior portion of the retroperitoneum. And by doing so in this very thin person, you can then immediately see their kidney. 
And adjacent to this is some of the perinephric and periadrenal fat, which can be separated from the posterior musculature here. So remember, we're on the left adrenal bed and left kidney. And so medial on the screen here is going to be the paraspinous musculature adjacent to the spine. And then likewise, the aorta. When you see the pulsing over there, that's what that is. Um, so now the surgeon is working cephalad to where the kidney is through some of this areolar uh, and perinephric fat to identify the adrenal gland. See there, you can start to see the yellow adrenal tissue within the yellow perinephric fat. Now moving inferiorly to the bottom aspect of the adrenal here, this is the kidney, and we're just at the inferior medial aspect of the adrenal gland here. This is the edge of the, of the gland and he's looking for the adrenal vein. Again, we use a ligature or harmonic uh, vessel sealing device for a lot of the small vascular lymphatic and fatty attachments. And here again, working medially, we're gonna isolate that medial edge of the adrenal. And there you can see the adrenal vein. Just here. These other linear attachments can all be taken with our vessel sealing device, leaving our adrenal vein and optimizing the ligation of it. All right, speeding up a little bit here. Good. So as he works along the medial aspect of the adrenal tumor here. You can see a second vascular structure coming down here. This is the phrenic vein running along the medial aspect of the left adrenal gland and joining with the adrenal vein. Um, and in a second, there's a really excellent view here prior to ligation. There. Phrenic vein coming down, joining with the adrenal vein, and then together they drain into the left renal vein. So here is a lovely dissection of the medial aspect of the adrenal tumor, preparation of the adrenal vein for ligation, which in this case they are doing with, with the ligature based on the small caliber. You can also clip, which is my standard practice. Um, and then this gives you a really nice view here of the peritoneum, just on the anterior surface of the adrenal gland, but not violated. Um, which keeps your retroperitoneal insufflation within your space um, and allows you to have this small but adequate working space. Here the tumor is completely, completely freed and will be excised <clears throat> or removed from the body using an endocatch bag. All right, so the next nuance of surgical management is the cortical sparing adrenalectomy. And <clears throat> as we'll talk about in just a second with the genetics of these tumors, this can be an appropriate operation for patients with a known genetic condition that may predispose them to bilateral disease. Um, and so while a bilateral adrenalectomy can certainly be performed, um, it's not ideal because it commits the patient to lifelong hydrocortisone or steroid therapy uh, to replace the corticosteroids that the adrenal gland is making. Um, and so if we have a high suspicion that a patient is going to need a bilateral adrenalectomy at some point, then this approach where only the tumor is excised, but the remaining adrenal gland is left intact um, is an excellent approach uh, for resection of a pheochromocytoma specifically. And in this particular operation, we would leave the adrenal vein intact so that the steroids and other hormones coming from the cortex can still be secreted into circulation. All right, so circling back a bit to our rule of tens. Um, as we mentioned before, 10% of these cases can be genetic or inherited. Um, and so we're going to focus a little bit on, on that aspect of it now, because it's a very unique uh, aspect of a lot of endocrine tumors. The known mutations to cause a pheochromocytoma are listed here. There's basically four families of them. The RET proto-oncogene is associated with MEN syndromes, multiple endocrine neoplasia. The VHL tumor suppressor gene is that of the von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, NF1, neurofibromatosis type 1, and SDH mutations, and we'll go through all of these 
um, in a second with their relative propensities for pheochromocytomas. Um, here you can see that this is the revised rule of tens for this one, that in fact up to 30% of pheochromocytomas have a genetic or inherited component, not 10% much more than we previously thought. So about a third of patients, this is actually attributable to a genetic mutation, whether that's a de novo mutation or one that they inherited unknowingly. Um, and so as a result, genetic testing in my practice is mandatory for every patient with a pheochromocytoma, regardless of age or a presentation. Um, as these are often diagnosed younger, that's more likely to be a genetic cause, but not necessarily, um, as often these can take years to diagnose. Von Hippel-Lindau syndrome affects lots of things throughout the body, but if they have a tumor in the adrenal gland, it will be a pheochromocytoma um, that is functionally active. Um, and in this particular mutation, these often are bilateral. About half of the time, they can get bilateral pheochromocytomas, not necessarily at the same time, but throughout the course of their life. And so having a known VHL mutation is a perfect time to think about a cortical sparing adrenalectomy rather than a complete adrenalectomy uh, for resection of a pheochromocytoma. Um, in the same vein, if this is a known mutation in the family and children have the diagnosis, they begin getting screened for pheo at age five uh, with annual serum metanephrines, although the average age for developing these tumors is around age 30. Neurofibromatosis type one actually is not associated with pheo very commonly. Certainly it has lots of other phenotypes uh, which we're familiar with like the neurofibromatosis fibroma seen on this patient here. Um, however, about up to 6% of these patients can develop a pheo. Um, but if you have a patient in your clinic that has neurofibromatosis and a diagnosis of hypertension, it is much more likely that they in fact have a pheo. Um, up to 50% of those patients will have one. And so screening is selective in this patient population and it is not standardized by any age or, or time requirement, um, but just on a selective basis. And these tend to be unilateral tumors. So SCH is kind of the new kid on the block and is largely the reason that the rule of tens has been modified from 10 up to 30% because with the diagnosis and discovery of these mutations in the early 2000s, we then found a whole new cohort of patients um, that had a cause for their pheochromocytoma we didn't previously know. Um, and this uh, subunit is located in the mitochondria and is back as part of the Krebs cycle. And so I'm not gonna harp on the Krebs cycle, um, but as you can see here, there's different subunits of this uh, membrane protein. Um, and the subunits, as they mutate, have different identifiable mutations. SDHB um, is taught, at least in endocrine fellowship, as B stands for bad, uh, another useful mnemonic. Um, but the reason that that's the, the case is because the majority, not the majority, but a large portion of these uh, tumors are malignant, uh, which is not the norm for FEOs in general, but in these cases, it, it tends to be bad. These tend to be malignant, they tend to have paragangliomas, they tend to happen for young people. Um, and so this is definitely an important mutation to be aware of. Um, less bad uh, is the SDHD component of this protein um, that can be mutated. And the D stands for dad in our mnemonic. Um, and the reason for that is that when this gene is inherited from the mother, the patient will not express the phenotype due to maternal imprinting. So the only time that it's passed in families is in a paternal lineage, um, and then the phenotype is expressed. Fortunately, these are rarely malignant, but can be multifocal. So again, is an important thing to diagnose and then follow these patients. So the no endocrine surgery talk would be complete without talking about multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome. As we know, there's an MEN1 and then MEN2A and 2B syndromes primarily. Pheochromocytomas are associated with a RET, proto-oncogene mutation, which means they're associated with MEN2. So let's talk through a patient as a great illustration of the importance of diagnosing the genetic component of these tumors. So a 38-year-old man presented actually with pretty typical symptoms of a pheochromocytoma. He had a new diagnosis of hypertension, he had episodic headaches, palpitations, and indeed imaging showed a right adrenal mass and his plasma metanephrines were markedly elevated. We performed a laparoscopic right adrenalectomy 
And his pathology is shown here, confirming a five centimeter pheochromocytoma. Due to this finding, he underwent genetic testing, which is performed most commonly in our institution using the BROCA panel. I know many of you are familiar with this for a variety of other malignancy workups, um, but as you can see, it highlights all four of the different types of genetic mutations responsible for pheochromocytoma. So this is the most cost-effective method of genetic testing for these patients. And when our patient had this genetic testing, they identified a RET mutation. So previously healthy had no known diagnosis of MEN syndrome, but now has a diagnosis of MEN2A uh, based on this mutation. And so there's been a lot of research uh, connecting the genotype for the RET mutation to the phenotype. And you can see here that with his particular mutation, there was actually a fairly low uh, only about 20 to 30 percent lifetime incidence of pheochromocytoma, but in our case, that's what he presented with. He has an overall low chance of hyperparathyroidism, but most patients with MEN2 will get medullary thyroid cancer at some point in their life. Um, and as such, for this patient, we evaluated him for medullary thyroid cancer knowing that he had this mutation. Unfortunately, his calcitonin and his thyroid ultrasound were normal. However, given the high risk for developing medullary thyroid cancer with this mutation, we recommended a prophylactic thyroidectomy, um, and indeed a small cancer was found uh, incidentally on that final pathology, measuring only three millimeters in size uh, with no invasive features and no lymphatic spread. However, uh, you can imagine that without this diagnosis of the RET mutation, this would not have been found until it was already larger and likely had already spread. Um, and more importantly for this patient, now that he's had this genetic testing and the diagnosis of the syndrome, his young children can be tested as well and hopefully treated as well with prophylactic thyroidectomy before they too develop medullary thyroid cancer. All right, so we've modified our rule of tens. Our genetic component has gone from 10 up to 30%. And our next topic is gonna be malignant disease. Um, and so this in fact is present a little bit more uh, than what we thought, again, in part due to the diagnosis of the SDH uh, segment of the population, as many more of those tend to be malignant. Um, and so about 15 to 17% of patients with pheochromocytoma, this will in fact be malignant. So I wanna walk you through another patient. And this is a pretty uh, rare scenario and startling, but nonetheless illustrates that these tumors can be pretty bad when they're bad. Um, this is a 37 year old woman, also previously healthy, and she presented to an ER with pleuritic chest pain. Uh, she had a history of neurofibromatosis, um, but no history of hypertension. So as I mentioned earlier, not, uh, not a high suspicion for pheochromocytoma, only up to 6% of patients with neurofibromatosis have these tumors. Um, and she you know, maybe had occasional palpitations, but no other symptoms to really point you towards this diagnosis. However, uh, on her imaging, she had an enormous left adrenal mass as well as some small liver uh, and lung nodules as well, which was highly suspicious for a primary adrenal malignancy with metastatic disease. In the course of her workup, she appropriately had serum evaluation of her catecholamines, which were also markedly elevated. Interestingly, you'll note that these levels are almost identical to our previous patient, uh, despite the difference in size of their tumors. Um, and then at an outside institution, she actually had a biopsy of her liver lesion and confirmed that this was in fact a metastatic pheochromocytoma. For debulking purposes to help both uh, with her active symptoms um, of difficulty breathing as well as debulking her, her hormonally productive uh, tumor burden, we performed an open left adrenalectomy. And you can see here, uh, this is a very thin patient, um, but the tumor was readily um, apparent in the left upper quadrant upon left subcostal incision. Um, and the tumor itself was very well encapsulated as is typical of pheochromocytomas, either benign or malignant, um, and quite large. Uh, it measured 27 centimeters, um, but pathologically varied quite a bit from our previous patient. Um, microscopically, we saw extensive necrosis, lymphovascular invasion, and focal spindle cell morphology, all of which are bad prognostic signs that this is indeed a malignant tumor. And unfortunately, three weeks postoperatively, her disease rapidly progressed. You can see the burden of metastatic disease here within her liver and lungs. Um, and 
as she recovered from her operation successfully, we made plans as quickly as we could for systemic therapy, um, which involved first uh, Dota tape PET scanning. So I wanna to talk just a minute about this because this is a, a pretty unique scan that we use for the diagnosis um, of neuroendocrine tumors and has become more and more commonplace uh, for the diagnosis and treatment of metastatic pheochromocytoma. This first came in uh, June of 2016. Um, and has over time now uh, replaced the octreotide scan as the gold standard for neuroendocrine tumor imaging. So not just pheochromocytomas, but is often used for other neuroendocrine tumors of the GI tract or pancreas, um, in large part because it's a bit of a shorter exam and has some less radiation, um, but does require the certain um, gallium uh, 68 jodotate uh, tracer for this modality. Um, and UW was one of the first sites to actually have this um, available as it was rolled out after 2016. And so we were definitely the first in the Seattle area to offer the Dota Tate scans. Um, and now is much more commonplace throughout our city and other institutions, but, but certainly we were happy to have this at the beginning. Um, and over time, as it's become more incorporated nationally and more widely available, it's also been incorporated into the NCCN guidelines for the care of patients with metastatic pheochromocytoma as um, a somatin statin based imaging modality that is preferred. So metastatic pheo and paraganglioma are actually a difficult entity to diagnose because as I've shown you a couple samples of pathology, you'll notice that even with our last patient who clearly had malignant disease, the word malignant is not, and carcinoma, and those types of you know, words that you usually see identified with cancer um, aren't here. Um, and the pathologist likewise will not use the word benign pheochromocytoma either. Um, these, it's a very difficult um, to diagnose neuroendocrine tumors path, histopathologically definitively. And so the pathologists do an excellent job of describing the cells and giving us features that may make these tumors more likely to be malignant. Um, but they can't tell us for sure how it's going to act uh, clinically. And so it's important for us as the clinicians, both endocrinologists, surgeons, and even oncologists, uh, to follow these patients at a minimum with screening metanephrines annually to see if there's any recurrent or metastatic disease. And by definition, if any metastatic disease is diagnosed, then certainly this tumor was malignant, um, as was present in our, our last patient. But um, otherwise, it's often difficult to, to tell the patient one way or the other uh, whether their tumor is in fact cancerous, which is difficult. Um, as with our last patient, there is a, a proven benefit to surgical debulking for metastatic pheochromocytoma. Um, and when possible, surgical resection of all disease is ideal, but with widespread metastatic disease, that's often not possible. But debulking the primary tumor can have a lot of benefit. And you can see here it has a large impact on mortality. Um, but also symptomatically can go a long way in reducing the burden of catecholamine excess and improving the quality of patients' lives despite not curing them of their disease. So when surgical cure is not an option, we have to move to systemic therapy next. Um, and previously, metastatic pheochromocytoma was treated with not only systemic chemotherapy, but uh, radio-labeled MIBG. And this treatment had some efficacy, about a third response rate, but there was a lot of side effects um, and definitely had some room for improvement. And so more recently, um, with the evolution of the Dotatate PET scanning, has also come the usage of therapeutic Dotatate in the form of radio-labeled somatostatin analogs, which brand name is known as Lutathera therapy. Um, and this works by binding to the overexpression of somatostatin receptors on neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so this is certainly not a specific therapy just for pheochromocytoma, but has been evolving into a treatment for that after some success in the GI and pancreatic tumor population. Um, and so here you can see there's ongoing clinical trials in, in that population as well, um, but certainly now it is being used as a very new treatment modality for patients with incurable uh, pheochromocytoma, and we are just starting uh, to do this here uh, for our patients with metastatic pheochromocytoma. All right, so in summary, we've reviewed a bit about pheochromocytomas, including the rule of tens, which 
is definitely a helpful mnemonic, but needs to be with a caveat. Uh, there's a little bit more malignancy in these tumors than we previously appreciated. There's a lot more of a genetic or inherited component than we previously appreciated, up to one third of patients. And for this reason, I again would advocate genetic testing for all patients with a theochromocytoma. Um, and then additionally, there's a little bit more extra adrenal disease or paragangliomas than previously uh, thought. Again, due to the presence of those SDH mutations with a propensity for extra adrenal disease. Um, I'd like to thank David Bird for this particular mnemonic device. Have no fear of FIOs, they're fun, and I would agree. Um, these are a very unique subset of patients that need multidisciplinary care pre, intra, and post-operatively um, to coordinate a safe resection of these tumors. Um, but it's a great operation and a great patient population to work with with a very immediate impact on their quality of life by improving um, their hormonal excess um, and oftentimes mass effect from these very large uh, tumors. So um, I hope this was helpful in refreshing everyone on your medical school knowledge of these tumors um, and bringing you up to speed with where we're at now at the University of Washington and a little bit nationally uh, for the care of these patients. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, Dr. Zern. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, we certainly have time to have uh, questions, so I'll, we'll leave it open if anyone would like to either use chat or certainly uh, open up your microphone and feel free to ask questions. Hi, this is David Bird. Nicole, that was fantastic, both in the content and the delivery of the presentation. And granted, I'm a bit biased about the topic and a bit biased about you, but uh, two comments. One is uh, the the hap the uh, elevation of blood pressure during an operation for FIO, whether you know you're operating on a patient with FIO or you don't, reminds me of what's going on with the coronavirus in that once you start to see elevated blood pressure at all, if you stop right then, you will still see a rise in that blood pressure for about 10 minutes that is not controllable by the anesthesiologist with all the drips that they have, and you become helpless spectators in watching that go up. And that's why that communication, as you had stressed, is so key to have them speak to you or you're looking at the monitor at any point in time. And again, it reminds me of the coronavirus. Once you see the spike, it's too late to close the bars. The cat's out of the, cat's out of the whatever cats get out of, horses out of the barn and you're going to you're a spectator for that so that's just my ongoing analogy that may or may not work for people but what i really want to comment on is the pathways that, that nicole built now she mentions co-chairs with ron pauline this was nicole's baby and the, it was so impressive both in the outcome of an outstanding pathway for safety of these patients but a true collaborative effort to bring the anesthesiologists in the endocrinologists in, the critical care team in, and the surgeons in, in a way that I thought was pretty phenomenal, Nicole. And you kind of downplayed your role in really doing this entire effort. I thought it was incredibly impressive. So really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Dr. Zern, uh, this is Doug Wood. I, I enjoyed your presentation as well. And I, I, I'm embarrassed to say in front of everyone, I didn't even remember there was a rule of 10. So I, I had a lot to, a lot to learn here. Um, and following uh, David's comments, you know, I think I, I'm especially impressed with that work that you've done with your colleagues in developing multidisciplinary pathways and work to manage complicated patients that that need more than surgery. And obviously it, it doesn't take us very much effort to kind of look at other parts of what we do and find places where um, there's opportunity for us to have a more formal coordination of effort like you've developed for this. Maybe give us some tips on how you brought this together uh, for you know, to help the rest of us faculty that are thinking about uh, analogous 
disease processes that maybe we should coordinate better with our medical colleagues or anesthesia colleagues or others? Absolutely. Um, first, I think when I first started on faculty, I recognized the need for something like this after about a, a year, um, noticing just the variability in different uh, provider practices, primarily from an anesthesia standpoint. Um, and uh, Ron Paul Dean, as many of you who know him, is pretty verbal when he notices uh, something. And he also uh, had been, you know, pretty noticing some variation in his colleagues that he recognized as a need for quality improvement as well. And so he and I met several times just together, brainstorming how uh, we could come about improving overall standardization and care of these patients. And then that evolved into incorporating a member of the transformation of care team. And that would be my actual main advice for anyone who's making any type of clinical pathway. It doesn't have to have a power plan um, in the medical record, but the representative from their team was so helpful in coordinating the production of these patient-centered documents, uh, coordinating the meetings, sending out minutes for the meetings, um, and really helping keep us all uh, on the same page and organized with deadlines and things like that. Um, whereas I feel like if it was just left to clinicians, we, you know, may have not prioritized it as well as we thought. Um, but Ron and I set out this entire, you know, schedule of when we wanted to meet and then identified stakeholders for each aspect of the care. And so I think that's what made it more feasible for all of the multidisciplinary providers was that they didn't have to go to every meeting. They just needed to go to the ones that pertain to their particular realm. So Dr. Sewer with the pre-anesthesia clinic just came to the preoperative care meeting um, and had a ton of input and then helped revise the, that part of our guidelines, um, but didn't have as big of an impact on the intraoperative care, for example. Um, and so it made it a lot easier for clinicians to build these meetings into their schedule when they were required to go to all of them. Um, and I think those were, were very, very helpful. Well, that's great work and thanks for the tips. I think that uh, in this group, there's lots of faculty who uh, I think maybe are partway in the process or, or thinking they'd like to do it. And it's helpful to see where it's been successful and know how to have some paths for getting there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you all again for being here this morning. I want to make uh, just two, two short announcements. Uh, we will actually have two additional grand rounds this month. Uh, there is actually a multidisciplinary grand rounds uh, that we are hosting on the 15th uh, and another one on the 22nd. Uh, the 22nd in particular uh, pertains to um, all of us with a program that we are hoping to bring to the University of Washington with regards to mindfulness and wellness. So I will just say, you know, make sure you pay attention to any email alerts you get, but put those on your calendar for Grand Rounds on the 15th and the 22nd of July. Thank you for being here, everyone, this morning. <laughs>